the vision that i had was very simple is to say that i want to become cfo and i want to do an ipo first 10 years in infrastructure then 10 years in telecom then 5 years in uh, e-commerce and now in financial services you know i was in vodafone doing very well spent almost 6 years there two roles uh, cfo of mumbai which was largest circle and then i was promoted to india financial controller uh, preparing for an ipo etc and then geo happened so our ipo couldn't happen because geo launched and market changed. You decided to, you know, kind of change uh, into another sub vertical. So, so uh, tell us why join PayU? I think it could. It came to a logical end for me. I think I was at peak. And then I was reflecting that what is the next big thing, right? And and this is where I go back to what I described earlier that, you know, at least from the time I have been in telecom, I've been able to see slightly bigger purpose uh, and figure out the sectors which are, which are going to be big thing in my view and which are going to make meaningful contribution to the society. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Strategy of Finance podcast, where we celebrate the profession and the professionals in the world of finance. We endeavor to unpack their journeys to understand what moves them, get inspired by their triumphs, learn from their experiences, and most of all, connect with them at a personal level. Today, we are graced by the presence of Arvind Agarwal. With qualifications like Chartered Accountant and Company Secretary, Arvind is a seasoned finance expert with over 25 years of experience. He has shaped up some of the most marked key businesses in India, including Amazon India, Vodafone India, and Tata Tele Services. Recently, he helped Nika, a new age beauty e-commerce unicorn, to IPO and is currently serving as the CFO at PayU India, a leading fintech platform. His working style include working with business acumen, strategic thinking, seeing the big picture, adding value through cross-functional inputs, and handling demanding situations with relative ease and passion. This episode is especially a trend for anyone who loves frameworks. Let's end the wait and listen on to learn, grow, and inspire. Hi, Arvind. Welcome to Strategy of Finance podcast. Really great to have you on. Hello, Rohit. Thanks for inviting me here and I'm really excited to talk to you today. Great. Thank you, your audiences. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Why don't we start with learning about your journey and understanding the key milestones that have shaped your career so far? Yeah, sure. So, hey, I've just completed 25 years. I, I realized that I, I've completed 25 years after doing my CA and I just joined my first job around the same time in 1998. So I'm CEO of last century, if you may call it. Congratulations. That. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, of course, I also did MBA from Ahmedabad then company secretary. Uh, if I talk about my journey and before that, why did I choose CA, right? That's a standard question I get. And I think it's it goes back to my, my roots and my family background. And we are actually a family of chartered accountant, uh, if I may say so. Like my uncle was director in ONGC, long back he did see in 1970s, he was an inspiration and almost uh, 15, 16 chartered accountants my family. So, you know, it comes naturally to us and belong to Jaipur, Rajasthan, it seems like it's a factory of uh, CA. Uh, but yes, I chose it purposefully uh, because one, I was inspired by my uncle, like I said, and second, because I thought, uh, you know, I have uh, finance in my DNA. Uh, like a Mawadi family, normally uh, finance is in the blood. So it came naturally. That's why I chose it. Now I've spent, uh, this is my third decade in the career. And I, I think if I have described it, let me divide it into three parts. The first 10 years were more of formative years. And um, I did various things there also. Uh, but basically I didn't know, uh, you know, which path I'm headed to. Uh, I had a vision but not a strategy and I jumped into things which not necessarily I thought well, planned well. Then uh, next 10 years, I think it was more of, uh, you know, uh, seeding in leadership into me and I got great mentors and they showed me the path and I learned a lot about org building, about team building, about how to think about career, etc. And so that was my second decade and the third decade is more of now applying what I've learned right it's not just about learning 
your conviction improves if you apply your learnings and that itself gives you new learnings right so so i would say my third decade which is where i joined as a ceo for nike and henceforth is more of uh, applying my concepts and then of course it strengthens my conviction and confidence into what i've learned that's awesome i can totally relate to being this uh, fam being from a family of cas um i think if i count uh, i come from a family of 10 cas and i was the first one to not to a ca um you you very well laid out the journey uh, of your last 25 years i would love to piece it um uh, i'd love to unpack it a, a little bit more you, you you said a wonderful thing you had a vision but not a strategy was that prior to doing your chartered accountancy or that was post chartered accountancy as well no actually as young ca you know i had a vision uh, in fact so it was when i was studying ca and we used to talk like among the friends so the vision that i had was very simple is to say that i want to become cfo and i want to do an ipo i didn't know much about ipo then actually but i thought it's a big thing and uh, yeah being a cfo was definitely homework because i had seen my uncle's journey so i thought that's a right way to build a finance uh, professional career so those were my vision but i didn't have a strategy how to become a cfo how to really think about ipo in fact early stage you don't understand what is an ipo so i, I would say had a vision but not a strategy it it got formed over years later much later when i learned about you know capital raising and how you know private and public company differs in their orientation and how they talk to market so a lot later i formed a plan around it at that kind of early age when you have just finished your chartered accountancy a common dilemma that comes in front of everyone uh, who has uh, you know who is at the stage is whether to go for corporate finance sort of a company route or work at a ca firm or any of the big fours and so on right you chose the corporate finance path from the get go what was that decision because again typically um it it seems like again more of the cas do tend to go and spend maybe few years even a couple years at a big four and then maybe land on to the corporate finance side you know i think that part was very clear in my head um, like i said my vision was to be cfo and i thought cfo of a large company large listed company and uh, that's possible only if you go in corporate finance rather than your own entrepreneurship or a professional uh, uh, practice right so it, it was a test to my vision and i was i uh, attempted for a campus interview and i appeared for an interview for tcs that didn't happen but you know i kept trying right and those days country was just getting liberalized opportunities were not too many in the corporate but it was shaping up uh, but i kept trying and i landed well um, not first job second job but definitely i found my path but never wanted to do a professional practice because that doesn't get aligned with the vision that i had makes sense tell us a little more about that those first sort of uh, formative 10 years you have spent most of that time in telecom or you know related sort of broadband service areas what was the environment like back then um and what did you take out from those years now that you still apply in your day to day role yeah so let me first again describe uh, you know how my career has shaped right so first 10 years in infrastructure uh, then 10 years in telecom then 5 years in uh, e-commerce and now in financial services right so they are very different sectors but then there is one thing in common all of those companies where i worked were very high growth uh, tech driven and consumer facing organizations and that's what excites me that that is why i chose what i chose um and the other thing is and it's more a hindsight it's not necessarily that i had that kind of a purpose in my career but when i think about it uh all those sectors were had a bigger societal purpose they were contributing to nation building in very very meaningful way and i joined them when they were at the inflection point and able to create this proportionate economic value whether it was telecom whether e-commerce i think financial services that i have just landed now 
is again an inflection point uh, and is going to really play a big part uh, in the in India getting doubled as an economy in the next five seven years. So yeah, so that's a bigger purpose, but that is something that I related much later. Uh, but when you work in such companies where you are contributing to society, uh, it really gives you a you know satisfaction at the end of the day that it's not just your career but it's also about contributing something to society makes a ton of sense so during those again the the first maybe 10 odd years uh, were you focused on a particular area or was it broad in terms of the finance exposure that you were able to get because in large organizations what one would imagine that there are specialists for each of the spaces whether you think about taxation whether you think about accounting whether you think about financial planning analysis and so on yeah, so in first 10 years, I was very open. I was very hungry for growth and I was very hungry to learn, uh, to develop myself as overall um, skill set for, a, you know, a finance professional. So I did controllership uh, uh, for first five, six years. And then uh, one of uh, my mentor and a leader, he actually pushed me outside my comfort zone and he, he asked me to start doing fp and corporate finance and then and that uh, and since i did well in those challenges then after that there was no looking back and i picked up uh, head of finance role in tata docomo so yeah the first one was a bit of push by a mentor but all of it later was natural journey uh, and then it was profounded later when i was in vodafone one of my mentor he was the ceo of vodafone mumbai circle and he said that career is never a straight line it is always a zigzag uh, and you need to do a lot more lateral movements and it's not necessarily a vertical growth that you will get, right? So I did, I continued those experimentation at much bigger canvas and much bigger scale at the mid of my career and that also helped. But yes, in formative year, I was open, uh, did a lot of stuff. In fact, I landed into a startup and much before when startup was a fancy word, uh, this was 2000. Eight, uh, 2006 to 2009 journey. Uh, the startup was called U Broadband, uh, and uh, we we were basically trying to sell home broadband Wi-Fi. In that time, it was not a very well-known thing. Country was still 2G country, and we were trying to sell fixed line broadband. Right, so novel concept. We raised money from City Ventures, almost 500 crore term sheet. This was in 2006, and uh, what happened in 2008 uh, because of Lehman crisis and in fact Citibank also got into trouble, US government had to bail out. So City Ventures said that we can't fund you anymore and we were left without any investments. We were still burning cash. Uh, so after 200 crore they said we don't, we can't fund you anymore. So you have to find your ways. And I was still young in career but um, and the CFO left and uh, my CEO said that, that you will be acting CFO and I was just what eight to ten years in the career but uh, you know learned a lot in uh, 12 to 18 months we uh, converted the cash burn situation into a cash positive situation in fact uh, so in that startup from first customer to 500k customer from zero revenue to 100 crore revenue and from cash burn to EBITDA positive uh, in three years right so that was my journey and I was tested really hard during those times, uh, startups were not fancy. There are not too many capital raising options available. We went, I used to actually go to lots of banks to raise uh, working capital. And, uh, you know, in fact, we did some innovative vendor financing with Cisco, which was, they were supplying us routers, but they were also giving us three year uh, time frame to repay those routers. So a lot of interesting stuff that time, uh, but it was very enriching. After that, of course, I, I had a lot more clarity of what a finance professional is supposed to do. Wow, very cool. What led you to move from infra, telecom, broadband related spaces to then Amazon, right? Which was uh, certainly have by that time have sort of established themselves in the US and many other markets and were kind of just starting to get their foothold in the India market. Yeah, this one I can claim that it was very thoughtful move, uh, unlike the others one which I described earlier. So, you know, I was in Vodafone doing very well, spent almost six years there, two roles, uh, CFO of Mumbai, which was largest circle, 
and then I was promoted to India Financial Controller, uh, preparing for an IPO, etc. And then Geo happened. So our IPO couldn't happen because Geo launched and market changed. But around that time, there was few things happening. Uh, so I think Telecom was on downhill. I could sense that uh, it was commoditized, hyper competitive. There was no pricing power, so it was on downhill. But the thing which was uh, now coming to a positive inflection curve was e-commerce, because there were four things that happened around the same time. The first thing was 4G, uh, which means affordable internet to every Indian. The second thing that happened was UPI, and as you know that in India, not too many people have credit cards, and only five percent people have credit cards. So UPI changed the game. You can actually pay online through UPI. The third thing which happened around the same time, 2016, 2017, was GST. And before GST, it was state-wise taxes. But because of GST, you could actually have one India pricing. So India became one market. And you don't need to have different pricing for a same product uh, across India, right? So that that is big enabler for e-commerce, I must say that. And the fourth thing was infrastructure. So even physical infrastructure improved and we could deliver things in three days anywhere in the country so i i could see you know this positive tailwind kind of forming up for e-commerce and i jumped on to join amazon amazon was a big brand but not in india uh, in us in india it had launched in 2014 and 2017 is when i joined them it was still launch in the launch mode right we when i joined we were launching one category every month that was the pace if I talk about Amazon now, and by the time I left, it had almost 50 categories. And if you debundle Amazon into, let's say, 50 categories, a separate business, they'll all be at least a unicorn. So it's, it's like 50 unicorn bundled into one mega uh, business, uh, which is called Amazon. Um, I learned a lot. I was actually, it, it is a grind. Uh, I was tested for many things that I had learned, but still had to relearn a lot. And three years was really enriching. Because of that exposure, I claim that I know unit economics of every business model that you want to do online. Because I was sitting in the cockpit working closely with Ragwa, who is the CFO. And I was the person who was actually reporting PNL, how we are doing on performance parameters for each of those 50 categories and across six channels. So publishing almost 300 PNLs. So really went into deep of unit economics of each of the business or category as they, they used to call it. But yeah, I explained to you why I chose Amazon and how enriching it was. I can go on and on about Amazon, but I think I'll pause now and wait for your next question. Amazing, amazing. Tell us uh, what kind of switches maybe in your mind or what kind of new you know learnings or relearnings that you had to go through when you moved from Vodafone to Amazon both are global organizations I'm sure there is a lot of lot of roll-up happening to global orgs and so on but I got to imagine the working style of both of these companies is quite different right um, although you have had a startup experience, but Amazon would be a completely different beast altogether. Can you share some insights in terms of maybe the differences between Vodafone and Amazon and just in general, how is it to work in something like an Amazon? Yeah, actually, uh, let me first start with, you know, how I felt for six months. Actually, I felt lost there. It's a big world. Uh, in the sense it's a global uh, companies and uh, mega corporation uh, but you know the way it is structured is very different than how a typical organization like Vodafone would have structured where you can actually relate to one CEO, CFO and the whole org right is sitting in India that was not the case with Amazon uh, different teams working out of different geography some of them were working out of US, some of them were working out of Middle East, some of them were working out of Southeast Asia, some of them in Bangalore, but different offices. But, you know, what? and I was trying to figure out how this bloody thing works, right? People 
i i didn't know many of my colleagues uh, uh, you know in controllership for example despite being a finance professional myself i was on the business finance side then i figured out uh, which team works on it and how it is structured but i think the the learning here was how it works right it works because it has one common vision which is called customer centricity so everyone is tied to this one big umbrella vision uh, which is that everyone is working for customer i have not seen any other company really be behaving true to the core how to delight customers they all claim it but i don't think anybody does it better than amazon so if i do a little bit of contrast and learning between vodafone and amazon both great companies vodafone was so i i, I learned people leadership and process excellence in vodafone because that was also a 20 billion dollar balance sheet and sizable business but i learned process excellence and people leadership it's very human company and you know my initial seed in leadership was uh, it, it's i owe it to vodafone so people leadership process excellence are the those two attributes but what i learned in amazon was customer centricity and operational excellence right so there are a lot of mechanisms they have which make sure that you are uh, answering in case of dilemma you choose a path which is right for customer it will it is assumed that it will be good for shareholder also and operational excellence which means that you keep improving every day uh, so that you know you are better and better so those two are absolutely fantastic uh, learnings in uh, amazon makes a ton of sense now let's uh, talk about the nike journey as i think about any company becoming ipoable especially kind of a storied company like nike the investors would want to play very safe in terms of appointment of the cfo who would take the company public and you know as one of my friends say it's a gold standard for a cfo to take a company public and run it as a public organizations which you have certainly achieved right tell us what led the investors and the management team founders to say you know arvind is the right person although he has not been the cfo of a india listed public company already we want to entrust him with this responsibility and we want to back him on this role yeah i i'll first tell you what was my side of it right why i came to nike and how it how my past and he helped me in settling there and taking the big mission so you know i was in amazon doing very well 2017 2020 and then covid came in and uh, you know my role was based in bangalore my family was always based in mumbai they didn't move to bangalore because of children's study etc and when covid came in and vaccination was still not in sight that's when <laughs> we were all scared as human beings right so so as my family and my wife said you're not going back to bangalore although amazon had already allowed work from home but it's is a little bit more psychological right and therefore i started searching online and i got nike so in fact the whole transition was digitally done i handed over digitally i joined virtually almost for first 5 6 month i didn't meet anyone in my team at nike uh, we were all joined up through calls right uh, so very different motive but it also you know an opportunity which i felt you know like i this described in the beginning beginning of third decade i was thinking that in vodafone i have been left hand uh, person to cfo and in amazon i have been right hand person to the cfo and i think time has come that i should ideally jump into a cfo role if i get one and i did get one in nike um, now nike if, if i describe my nike journey of two and a half years when i joined right it was one business when i left it was four businesses for different business verticals when i joined it was still a loss making company when i left it was a profit making when i joined it was a unicorn we listed at decacon so private to public unlisted to listed 
loss making to profit making one business to four business. So I think in two and a half years, we could together achieve what a typical, you know, company will achieve in five years. Uh, because there was a mission, and uh, you know, I used to hear this uh, from a leader in Amazon. He used to say uh, that we should learn from three companies, and that's this was Amazon, right? Amazon was the hallmark. But the leader used to say that we should learn from three companies. We should learn from Big Basket in grocery, we should learn from Mintra in fashion, and we should learn from Nike and Beauty. And this was also playing in my head, right? That there must be something unique at Nike. Which is working well, right? So, and then of course uh, I met Falguni, uh, and uh, uh, they would have done some ref check for me uh, before taking bet on me. Uh, one of the director who met me later told me that she had ref checked for me in Vodafone, uh, and of course, like I told you, that Vodafone was a big role that I was doing, and I was in the IPO team. IPO couldn't happen, but I, we had done everything what which was. required to keep it ready we were ready to file the rhq but geo launched in the market dynamics change so i think some of that work also paid back in my reference check uh, if i if i just now summarize i think what made me successful in nike is combination of what i learned in vodafone and amazon right so because of amazon i learned the e-commerce uh, and that was very handy in nike uh, and because of Vodafone. I learned how to build processes that scale, and how to, you know, keep how to make a company ready to go for uh, listing. So those two learnings came handy, and then I could run fast in Nike. Uh, I think, yeah, for Nike's uh, leadership also, the bet paid off, uh, and they all appreciated my contribution. But I'm sure they they would have done some ref check, and my past work uh, would have also paid back. And therefore, you know, whenever I Uh, join uh, join a company. I try to leave a mark. I try to accomplish something, right? So that people remember me. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, what a story Nike has been, and uh, what a journey you have had there. We'll certainly unpack a lot more on the IPO side a little later in this podcast. But uh, tell me the move uh, to pay you. I'm sure you could have just coasted at Nike as a public company CFO quite easily. but you decided to you know kind of change uh into another sub vertical of technology and you know put yourself into another sort of you know rather uncomfortable position at least from being the cfo of a publicly listed company as nike so so tell us why join pay you yeah sure uh, so see um, not only till ipo after ipo I spent a one year uh, at nike right so four quarters of earnings release post ipo was done during my tenure and even the first agm and world general meeting of shareholders that's a different thing right in a public company and even the let's say post lock up expiry placement of investors who wanted to exit so all of that was a lot of work that i had done there and i think it could it came to a logical end for me i think i was at peak and then i was reflecting that what is the next big thing right and and this is where i go back to what i described earlier that you know at least from the time i have been in telecom i have been able to see slightly bigger purpose uh and figure out the sectors which are which are going to be big thing in my view and which are going to make meaningful contribution to the society right so telecom was at inflection point when i joined vodafone e-commerce was uh, at inflection point when i joined amazon and i think between amazon and nike i had done most of the e-commerce and then i thought what is the next big thing i thought financial services is next big thing because i could see that upi is completely changing the landscape and you know uh, millions of transactions that are happening and now it's you know um, 10 billion transaction every month right so it's it's a scale the thing that i noticed that this is one innovation which is uh, sort of uh, which is adopted from bottom of the pyramid if you look at any other invention it goes top down right in you know the richer richer people adapt to the new technology first but this one is bottom of the pyramid every common man uh, is adopting upi 
uh, and their lives are becoming simpler due to this i think there is an uh, economic rational for it and there is a fun, there is a digital ecosystem uh, getting fueled by financial inclusion uh, that's the next big thing and i think we you know that's why i joined payu i it is an exciting story we process almost 5 million transaction every day for upi but the bigger thing here is we we not only do digital payment we also do digital credit and we believe that india is still a credit starved country and most of the people don't have credit card and now they know how to shop online they would need credit options as well right so we want to enable lot more uh, affordability and digital credit options for them and i think it's just a beginning that's the next big thing now if i paint it out next 5 7 years india will double right from 3 and a half to 7 trillion uh, that's a, those are the forecasts everyone is doing in 7 years another india will get added in terms of economic value and within that the digital adoption will go double so the multiply effect is 4x for anything which is shopping online or digitally and credit could be even 7 to 8x so because it is just beginning in terms of credit options so it's a massive massive opportunity but it also has bigger societal purpose which is financial inclusion and changing the society in a meaningful way so i that's why i landed here i got inspired from what my, my boss who was interviewing me ceo anirban mukherjee he told me he said that uh, we are professional entrepreneurs building an enduring institution uh, like like uh, maybe digital bazaar finance or digital hdfc something so professional entrepreneurs so that entrepreneurial energy i have because i worked in startups uh, but professional entrepreneurs and building an enduring institution so that inspired me and then i jumped on to join payu awesome certainly uh, all eyes on payu in terms of what the future hold for them you've spent a lot of time in broadband telecom and trend general then moving on to you know e-commerce with amazon which is i would say a lot more horizontal than vertical e-commerce with nike and then now fintech tell us how hard is it for a finance professional a cfo to make the transition from one industry to another and if there are certain commonalities that you found across these organizations yeah sure first let me describe the complexity right and i think <clears throat> uh telecom had profound complexity in terms of the jargons it used to have internally and i learned it hard way um, right so lot of kpis input metrics uh customer metrics were very very technical in nature let's say vlr ratio hlr ratio right a common man would would not understand but fundamentally it means an, a customer who is active and who is talking right something like that so from there if i go to e-commerce there you know the whole thing about gv to conversion gv is glance view right so page view glance view then you go to category pages and you you know there is an impression and then there is a click and then there is a conversion so the whole cycle of digital journey so those were very nuanced topics that i had to learn but what was common was uh, uh you know the fundamentals of finance fundamentals of finance is the unit economic right so when you scale the business uh you have to focus on uh or let's say let me describe it like this there are four four or five types of leverages right that you have to play on the first one is volume leverage the second one is unit unit cost leverage the third one is operating leverage the fourth one is financial leverage right so these are five, four types of leverages that finance person would understand what it means and they apply in different stages of business they apply a different proportion of priority uh, that remains common end of it when i joined nike uh, it was covid it was discretionary category uh, people were not going out who will use the makeup right so there was absolutely you know crash of sales in first three months and what you know obviously came naturally to me as cfo was to conserve the cash because cash is the king and that doesn't change and if i reflect back to my journey in u broadband long back in a startup you know how we use the every rupee which was available in the cash balance 
prudently we i applied the same uh, principle here and we survived that jolt and soon things started recovering and there was no looking back from there what i'm trying to say that the unit economics the path to profitability the uh, you know cash flow management and the financial discipline on capital is something which is common any business that you go and work with in that sense finance skills are quite fungible in my view got it very cool um across these sectors as i think through is it right to say that they are all they they all require upfront investments whether you think about broadband or telecom upfront infra investments or as you think about maybe an e-commerce or a fintech um there are a lot of upfront investments to be able to maybe change a consumer habit right like an amazon or a flipkart did from a horizontal e-commerce perspective or a nike did from a vertical e-commerce perspective and sort of pay you from a fintech standpoint is that right way to think about it or there are sort of nuances uh within that as well and maybe you know my analysis is not apt on no no your analysis is apt on it's just that the accounting standards make make them very different uh viewpoint both are investment if you think like a ceo if you think like a business head but actually in accounting standards both are different right so let's say telecom infra they are all asset heavy uh, business model right you put lot of money in balance sheet and then you generate a capacity and you start monet, you know generating revenue and monetizing it so it's asset heavy model versus let's say e versus um, uh, e-commerce such as amazon and uh nike they are actually asset light so their capex is not very heavy but to be able to reach to that break even situation you need to build a scale and to build a scale you need customers and to get your customers you need to invest you need to spend a lot of money on marketing uh and that takes time and uh, therefore you burn cash at the pnl opex level so they are asset light but opex heavy the telecom one is more of capex heavy but opex light model once you hit the scale you know ebitda is 35% in telecom for example i am talking about good days when pricing power was still there but in uh, retail business which is like nike i think ebitda of 10% will be fantastic because the return on capital will be 30% so you know ultimately you need to measure ro roe return on equity or return on capital employed i think that's a two me- measure if you have to compare different business model there's only one unifier which is roe or roc other metrics you know they apply differently in different businesses makes sense let's think about i mean you have spent a lot of time around the startup ecosystem uh, in india and i am sure you would have looked at multiple different businesses during your last you know 5 6 years time frame there's a lot of criticism about profitability or rather the lack of it in the india ecosystem why is profitab- profitability elusive in the new age businesses you alluded to this kind of opex versus, versus capex kind of a phenomenon are there other elements to it and how should people think about profitability of new age businesses see i i think little contrary in here i i don't think anybody gets a license by being called startup or new age business to shy away from discussion on profitability i think that's inherent in any business model otherwise why do you call it business right um in my view and i i i paraphrase it because i'm from telecom i call it 4g model and when in any discussion i'm talking about four things the first thing is growth which everyone loves to talk about right first g is growth but the second g is profitable growth right so you should choose those transactions which are adding some economic value to the organization if if you are giving a 200 rupee cash back for getting a customer who would have let's say annual contract value of 500 rupees does it make sense to you i i don't think it makes sense right but just to get customer numbers just to get uh 
some revenue, some GMV. These are vanity metrics. I don't think it's the right way of thinking, right? So in that process, you end up burning a lot of cash, which drags down and which makes your path to profitability even tougher. It's a vicious circle, if I may say so. I think you need to be choosing profitable growth from beginning. So that's the second key. The third thing is sustainable growth. Now, sustainable growth comes from the fact that how much your customer loves you. Is the customer coming again and again? And is the customer upgrading itself to a higher value transaction? That makes it sustainable, right? Otherwise, transactional. So have you built a, a emotional connect or brand connect or you know a life cycle connect with the customer? If you have done that, that will keep you keep uh, growing even if there is an adverse economic cycle, right? So your Customer value proposition has to be really strong and you need to keep on growing your repeat customer share in the revenue. The fourth G now I have added is responsible growth. It also goes back to, you know, your ESG framework, right? Responsible growth. Uh, for example, if you, if you are growing, but let's say the working conditions of your uh, manpower in the warehouse is in, inhuman. Someday it is going to blast all over your face, right? If you are ignoring the safety aspect, for example, the welfare aspect. So, you know, it's not a responsible growth. Uh, in my view, if you look for long term value creation for your shareholders and you want to be a long term business uh, success story, you need to focus on 4G from beginning. Uh, of course, your prioritization may you know, uh, increase. Let's say initially you want to prove the customer uh, uh, value proposition as a as a market fit. So you get into growth, but start looking at profitable growth, sustainable growth, and responsible growth in that tandem. Don't postpone it. That's my advice. Like Nike, for example, is unique because Palguni built that company in just 500, 500 crore capital. In 500 crore capital, uh, she built a company which was listed in 50,000 crore valuation, right? That was because she built it with a lot of financial discipline. She never threw good money uh, behind the bad money and tried to win the customer hurts who will keep coming again. That's why the repeat customer share of revenue is 80%. That shows how much customers love Nike. So I think that's a good example to uh, among the startup stories. That's an amazing framework to think through growth and profitability. I think also gives us a good segue to think about what is the role of a CFO in current times? How do you think about that? Yeah, so I think CFO plays uh, uh, two roles. Uh, on one side, CFOs are strategic finance partners, right? So they play as much role as a CEO would play or CBO would, would play in, uh, you know, contributing to the strategy as well as how do you execute that strategy successfully. So that's a strategic finance partnership role. The second, which is 180 degree to that is controllership role, which is to set the processes, governance, rules and discipline. Sometimes it also means that you are a little bit unpopular for Things, saying the things which people may not necessarily like. But I think that that is very much needed as CFO because we are also custodian of shareholder interest, right? So, uh, I mean, we are the voice of shareholder and the board in the company on day-to-day -day basis. That, that's what CFO uh, is supposed to do. So sit on the fence and be a great business partner, but also uh, make sure that the controllership and governance uh, is taken care of. Has that role changed over your tenure as a finance professional or has it remained more or less the same? I think it has changed. Uh, it has evolved. I think initially people used to see CFO more, more like controllers, people who would do the bookkeeping, reporting and helping in the governance. But uh, now everybody realizes that finance has a big role to play in the economic value creation. In fact, I describe it as 3V model. 
which is you know finance plays role in across the value spectrum and those three v's are product value uh, create value and unlock value right product value is about again control shape compliance governance you can't take chances with the compliance right so that is, that is how the company has already become unicorn right but if you don't have strong finance team that unicorn can become nothing right there are examples there are stories like that so that's product value second is create value where let's say i talked about nike had only one business model beauty but it became four businesses so i brought a lot of knowledge from amazon how to diversify etc and we debated and we ventured into uh, new verticals so how do you contribute to business strategy and uh, value creation that's the second role the third role is unlock value which is about strategic projects like ipo or m and a uh, right uh, or capital raise or capital structuring so finance plays a role across i think that appreciation is much more prominent now versus let's say 20 year back uh, but like i said some some fundamentals haven't changed right so when there is a crisis people will expect cfo to roll up the sleeves and save the company by the prudent cash flow management makes sense there has been this eternal debate and kind of exacerbated more recently with the more strategic nature of the cfo that should the cfo be a chartered accountant or maybe like a cpa in the us context or an mba right um most of your journey as uh, a cfo has been as a chartered accountant cs kind of professional right and then later on you ended up doing a strategic uh, or or rather a more executive mba right how do you think about that ca versus mba kind of a conundrum if you have to choose you know aspiring young professionals in your team how are you balancing those two traits yeah or is it a debate of ca versus mba really i don't think so why not ca and mba uh it's not ca or mba it is ca and mba is what i will advise in fact that's what i'm advising my my son he is doing ca and uh, we have this debates and i i tell him like this that ca is more like an engineering it's more a technical education but you need to layer it with more general management skills which comes from mba right so my advice is either you do engineering and mba or you do ca or an mba this is one and same thing uh, ca is more a technical education in my view uh, so one should have technical expertise on something that that brings the skills but mba teaches you how to think about business as a whole or a strategy or marketing other functions beyond your core domain that's also equally important if you want to grow into c c level leadership so both are important in my view there's no conflict very cool um you have led teams of multiple different sizes including you know teams of over 300 professionals at a time what is your approach to leadership yeah so again like i said um, i learned it in uh, vodafone uh, the golden rule that they used to teach is treat everyone the way you want to be treated that's so fundamental uh but it's not just that right and again because i use lot of jargon so let me give you one um, simple framework for this i'm i'm loving all of it yeah which is which is 3r uh respect recognition and reward i think you know as a leader you need to promote 3r's as a team member you will also contribute to that and you will feel that is is a team right which makes uh, a powerful union so respect is uh, fundamental uh, and that's w- very human thing you can't be yelling at your people right so respect is fundamental uh, recognition is the second layer which is you know you if something is job well done you better say it job well done and you say it publicly so that you know it motivates the person who has really excelled or taken that stretch and third is reward right which is about how this good work reflects into uh, monetary recognition or compensation which is market benchmark etc i think we need if you want to retain best of the talent then you need to take care of uh, these three r's 
I am not a HR professional, but I think instead of complex HR models, this is my simple approach. Uh, I also realize that five fingers are not same, which means people come with different skill set and different orientations and background. You need to identify the potential and the stronger aspect of the skill set in in one individual, and then harness that rather than you know focusing on the weak areas. On the weak areas, you do a co- role of a coach and try to uh, do a mentoring. But on the strength part, you need to really elevate, give them opportunity to play on their strengths. So if you provide such an environment, your team will stick to you. I take this pride that you know even if even after changing, let's say five six companies, people who worked with me, let's say in U Broadband or Tata Docomo, or what I mean to say that people who worked me long back also. Wants to work with me yet again uh, because you know it's it's a mutual respect and relationship of recognition and reward. Uh, also learning from each other. Uh, I think that makes a good leader, uh, which is what I learned in Vodafone. My mentors are actually like my men- lifetime mentor is ex Vodafone. He his name is Dilip Paul. So learned a lot from him. That's a great testament that people want to work with you again. Uh, let's think about uh, team building. How do you know that you want to hire for a certain position, and how do you go about then building the right kind of persona that you want to hire for that position? Actually, my um, model has bit changed after working in Amazon. And what Amazon believes is that you don't hire for a role; uh, you hire for the organization. What it means that. you know people should be movable across roles any which way uh, but they should have right uh, attitude and right uh, behavioral aspects of their leadership when you hire them so when they interview the candidate and it's a panel interview they do they have 14 leadership principle so they test the candidates on those leadership principles uh, and if the panel says yes you know uh, the candidate has at least 7 out of 10 or if they are testing for 10 let's say so then it's good enough because rest can come along uh so i think that's the right way of thinking about hiring uh because you may hire someone let's say for controllership but then how do you keep that person motivated for long career you have to rotate that person to a business facing role now that skill that person may may or may not have at the time of hiring but if that person has analytical skill then he can shape up into that role right he or she can shape up into that role so look for behaviors and look for skills rather than a functional domain expertise when you do the hiring that's the learning i have and i think it works do you have a go to question that you ask every candidate in uh, all of your interviews i ask them in their own words right i ask them that what are the top 3 things that you are proud of having achieved in your career uh because it gives me a sense of what challenges they were thrown to and how they applied themselves and why they feel proud of that particular achievement i think it it's a positive way of asking uh people about the challenges they have faced and how they've come out of it uh that's my favorite question it's very simple but it's very, it's my favorite question very cool i'll certainly think about that um what kind of impact technology has had on the finance function uh, i'm sure we have, you know across the various organizations you have deployed a bunch of different technology solutions for uh, for finance um you know finance technologies have evolved quite a lot as well how, how do you think about that yeah i can give you a contrast of how it started and how i see things right uh, shaped up so when i had started most of the work that we used to do was manual like we used to account for and tally and you know it was subject to human errors etc uh what's say let's say if i look at uh, our company uh, it's called vibmo uh it's a saas company under the payu portfolio there you know we have a process where a bo- bot will actually do end to end accounting and invoicing accounting reconciliation invoicing so what it does it downloads the file from bank server 
it then downloads the files from our server which has transition level data then both are matched and in case there are any exception they are thrown as alert uh, if there are no exception then it is posted into accounting system pushed to accounting system uh, which is sap and on the other hand it is pushed into invoicing system and then the third bot will actually uh, create the invoice and also email it to the customer so this is three bots doing end to end reconciliation accounting and invoicing with no human involvement the human knowledge is involved in developing right checks and balances in this process which is more a design and development uh, application so it has changed a lot uh, and if if i talk about the business that we do we do millions of transaction every day it's just not possible that i have let's say 100 200 people team just doing the reconciliation and cash matching etc it's just not possible it's not scalable it's a low margin business also so the only way we can survive is deploy technology at a scale which does auto match auto reconciliation auto invoicing and also accounting end to end uh, using the technology solutions that's what we have done in payu and i think so my goal in payu is to reduce the cost of transaction processing by 50% in next 3 years by using technology at a scale because that's the only way we can survive into this low margin business so technology is not just enabler it is uh, a business imperative now and finance plays a very important role in making sure that we are proactive in building uh, these technology solutions that will take care of accounting controls compliances as well as customer satisfaction well i was certainly very proud of uh, advising vidmo on that transaction to pay you when i was at avendus Good, good memories very good, good so memories good connect so I, i'm the beneficiary of what you advised now i advise it to everyone yes very cool uh, yeah if you have a magic wish what kind of technology would you ask for for your finance departments i think uh, uh, i we are now getting deeper into ai and see while ai has become a buzzword now but in fintech that has been uh in the design in the thinking in some shape and form but now now the time has come that we scale it as well uh let me give one example right so because we de- we do deal with financial transactions right and fundamentally financial transactions are subject to fraud despite your all the checks on kyc and risk monitoring etc so you need to develop algos which will highlight a potential fraud transaction and alert it real time so it's a fraud risk management uh which gets better with the data science and with the ai logic uh that's what we are trying to develop at vibmo at a scale it has been tested in payu now we want to uh make sure that it takes care of all the different use cases and probably we can out- outsell it to other fintechs also someday but my wish would be yes real time fraud monitoring at friction of the cost uh which is full proof uh and that's a very strong use case for business uh, benefits as well as compliance for rbi very cool makes a ton of sense i would now like to move arvind to uh, a broad topic of ipo right uh, you have been around this india startup ecosystem for a while now and uh, certainly nika has a unique place in the ecosystem where you were leading the charge of their ipo can we get a master class on ipo in india are you are you ready for that yeah i won't call it a master class but i'm happy to share my learnings for sure <laughs> so let's start with uh, kind of establishing how does a company know it's ready to go public what are the strategic considerations to think about yeah let me uh, let me give a simple framework again uh, and that comes after reflection after uh doing like i do i think there are three things that needs to tick off and uh, the first thing is market being ready uh the second thing is business being ready and the third thing is your processes being ready or i call it internal readiness so the first thing which is market uh, being ready is something that you don't control and since you don't control you shouldn't overthink about it uh there are experts who will advise you 
what is the right time to go for an ipo and they you know they are always doing it for their living right so banks will advise you advisors will advise you so it's not something that you should worry too much don't try to time the market uh, there are experts who will guide you it's anyway not in your control uh, the second thing which is business being ready is definitely something which is the first important tick that one should think of what do i mean by business being ready right now there are companies which have done ipo even when they were they were not making money or they were not profitable um, and that's okay so long as you can explain to the investor path to profitability in very succinct and you know a very uh, clear articulation of which kpi you track and how does it uh, become path to profitable measurement criteria and how do you reach there but i would still say that if you have a choice then avoid entering into market before you are profitable <laughs> so in my view let's say nike for example uh, and i learned it from falguni right she has been ipo banker for years and she has seen many hundreds of ipo maybe 100 ipo plus right as investment banker and she had that very clear thought process that we should be pat positive before we go ipo right and that made sense right because you know it it makes it it uh, clearly tells your investor that your unit economics is already proven and it's a profitable business model it needs capital to grow further and create value but there is no challenges in terms of business model being proven right nike was in uh, in ebitda positive zone for 3 years before ipo and just became pat positive before ipo it's a good sign good place to be in so the other thing about business uh, being ready i will tell okay unit economics should be proven you should be ideally seeing uh, first sign of profitability the other thing is have a clear strategy and not necessarily too many bets which are yet to be proven right so if you are if you have four business model one is proven three are yet to be proven it is still i will say postpone ipo for a couple of years uh, right Uh, so you know because the ability to experiment goes down dramatically once you are a listed company if you want to experiment continue to be private uh, and there are, there is enough private equity available it's not that uh, capital is a constraint for a private company right so one should be very clear why do you want to do ipo the objective of ipo should be very clear right so it could be raising of capital but then capital is available in private side also the other could be that you want to create a brand uh, which attracts talent which attracts other business partners that's a valid purpose the third could be that you want to build a positive performance pressure that right? you invite performance pressure once you are listed you will be judged every quarter how you are executing are you ready with that kind of maturity or not so these are some of the questions i think the last one which is process being ready that's where cfos play a big role and uh, that means that you have a solid finance team uh, also solid legal and company secretarial team right these two teams are absolutely you know uh, must to build before ipo because what you take on is lot more scrutiny lot more governance lot more regulations that you will have to comply on you know say b l o d r etc so so then you set up strong finance team like reporting controllership uh, uh planning budgeting all of that and you obviously set up a strong board because you know sebi rules requires us to have at least one third independent director so and directors will also expect finance team and secretarial team to be up to a standard where they can they can guide the organization through them right and then of course uh, you know you st- you should have ideally uh, big four auditors not necessary but i advise big four auditors because they bring different level of rigor and scrutiny in your numbers uh, so these three are must and then you start behaving like a listed company even before you are listed which means you have quarterly board meetings you have the independent board members coming on board early enough and they ask you right questions and you really 
put those disciplines and governance structure in place and then of course you can start working on uh, preparing the drhp which is very intense process of uh, you know 500 page documents 600 page documents so but anyway there are experts uh, experts in terms of lawyers and bankers who will advise you so i think what finance cfos need to do is to build strong finance team quarterly reporting processes uh, board governance and then ability to track the performance through very clearly defined measurable matrices that are auditable uh, i'll pause here i think this is my third bit of readiness uh, advice to the team um quick question how long before the actual ipo would you start doing the quarterly board meetings and kind of start acting like an ipo company a public company at least a year before uh, if not two years like in vodafone we used to do it any which way uh, even when we are not formally declared that we are going for an ipo because it just brings that level of uh, maturity in the company uh, and it really helps not just for an ipo but generally improve the compliance culture generally improve the performance culture uh, so in vodafone we started doing it much before maybe 2 3 years before ipo but uh, even if you do uh, one year before uh, you have a board in place and you have quarterly reporting and board presentation and review uh, that should be good enough for a startup company right but minimum one year you said something that was uh, one could put under a contradictory uh, or or a um, you know bucket where it's not a general perception where you said ability to experiment goes down dramatically as a public company as a startup especially as a technology company not necessarily a startup but more of a scale up but as a technology company one would think that you would continue to innovate and continue to remain at the forefront of your industry right if if experimentation or the ability to experiment goes down as a public company how should one think about putting a certain dollar behind certain experiments that can enable you to be at the forefront of those technology advancements like let, let's say ai for example many of the companies whether it's software or b2c internet companies they are public companies today if they have to invest let's say 10 million 20 million usd behind a certain effort and that is going to be seen quite unfavorably by the public market investors how should they juggle between those two no actually i mean it um, it's a fact that markets will expect you to deliver uh, consistent performance in fact one of the ability that you need to create is uh, to be able to not pause, not surprise the market negatively if or rather surprise the market positively if you can what basically it means that if you even if you don't give the guidance market will expect you to perform at a certain trajectory and and therefore if you venture out in a completely different direction and that is funded from your current pnl which you have not indicated to market market may not digest it at least in the short term it may take a couple of years or three years to recover from there it's a different thing how you how good investor communication you do but the fact is not everybody has same risk appetite in the public market right? there are different investor groups who invest for different purposes and different time horizon so versus a private company right where let's say if you have even if you have five six uh, investors on the cap table you'll be able to explain them what you're experimenting why you're experimenting and how it as to your core flywheel and how does it value help in the value creation for shareholders so your ability to experiment suddenly goes down uh, but i i don't intend to say that you don't promote innovation right because in the tech company innovation is integral to business model and therefore you know the way to do it is you keep some headroom uh, in your profits and you fund the innovation from your profits because then market is happy to say okay this company is delivering profit and yet able to fire a new flywheel from its own internal accruals it's an ideal situation but it's difficult to achieve okay so 
if you have some like let's say if, if a company which has a track record of so many years let's say infosys or tcs if they go into some kind of new business verticals i think market will digest easily because they have long track record of performance but a newly uh, newly uh, built tech company entering into a market and doing a complete u turn on its strategy or uh, business direction market will not digest it is my sense it will be a lot of hard task to explain it to market so better you remain private one should have very clear articulation of why do you want to go for ipo and what time there is no necessary thing about ipo if you are getting capital at your terms and somebody who is willing to back you up even in the private stage why do you want to do an ipo why do you, why do you want to rush into it i will rather say that let these initiative develop and mature and stabilize and then of course you have built a fantastic company which is profitable then of course next stage would be to go public makes a lot of sense um how critical is the role of leadership especially of a cfo in steering a company towards an ipo can you share any insights on maybe building and guiding a team through this whole ipo process no in fact cfo is the uh, pivot right who uh, plays a critical role in the whole process part of it and i said three readiness market readiness which is not in your control the business readiness is something which ceo has to steer the business leadership has to steer in fact i would rather say that cfo should take all the burden of ipo such that business teams are not distracted from what they need to build and perform on them uh, you know on the business part of it ipo can be actually a big distraction it can actually disrupt disrupt your journey if too much business bandwidth or leadership bandwidth goes into it so i would say that keep a detached process and let cfo lead it because anyway this is about getting you know board approval and then shareholder uh, approval and then sebi approval right all of that of course business uh, leadership plays important role in narrating the strategy and the equity story that comes from the ceo himself it has to uh, because that's what you are telling investors about how great this business is so that comes from the ceo but rest of it is more a compliance process and cfo can lead into that process uh, let business not de- get defocused while you are going for this very intense and you know at least 12 to 18 month uh, you know process of uh, uh, regulatory governance uh, talking to markets etc and i think cfo plays very critical role there but rest of the leadership can focus on the business makes a lot of sense um, as i think about a company becoming public one day and then trading on the borshes it's only human for the employees to start tracking the share price on a day to day basis right and it's not uncommon for the macro to change and then those stock prices across all the companies not just one particular company to move maybe you know move down 10% 20% even 30% over a matter of just a quick few weeks right how should a cfo think about managing that kind of a morale impacting event um across the company because people may just say hey maybe my share was worth you know 100 rupees yesterday now it's worth 70 rupees or 60 rupees and you know i'm just all of a sudden poorer by 30% 40% what a cfo should do in that, those kind of circumstances yeah no that's a very right question and it it really happens right it it is something that you you will face uh, and those are the perils of being listed um uh, but i think before that before you are listed right you start uh, engaging with the employees uh, where you show you know where you make them part of the value creation story right because what you're taking to market is the business and business is successful because of its employees right so how they are part of the value creation how they see the big picture and how they are part of the overall getting public uh, starts much before you are listed uh, i generally tell at least to the management team i tell that i you know we make a mistake in thinking that ip an exit event it is not an exit event it is actually an entry event you are entering into a market where 
different sets of investor will come and judge you and they have diff- so there could be foreign institutions there could be uh, sovereign funds there could be domestic mutual funds insurance companies hni right diff- diverse set of investors and everyone had different objectives some people have short term objectives some people have long term objectives different criteria of judging your performance so it's very complex so you are entering into that complex environment the only safest bet is uh, you continue to perform well right which means that everyone should focus on what they were focusing on even when they were private right whether you are private or public it is all about winning the customer when you know growing the revenue profitably and then delivering delivering the return on equity right if you focus on these three as you were doing even before uh, getting listed you continue to focus and execute well on those parameters market will reward you in short term it might so happen that uh, you know you you have a headwind or some pressure on the stock but it will bounce back and uh, i learned it from falguni right she used to say that uh, in short term stock market is like a voting machine but in the long run it is like a weighing machine right so if your performance is solid then the business is solid your customers love you uh, sooner or later your your stock will come back to where it should be and it will reward uh, to the employees and to the shareholders uh, and i think this is a constant uh, teaching uh, mentoring that she used to do i used to do uh despite that there will be some young employees who will get nervous about the stock moment you can't avoid it but of course you can be a little open inside the company to talk about what could be happening in the market but again you also you know also go through a very uh, stringent rule on insider trading so once you're listed the rules on prevention of insider trading will apply and employees are not supposed to talk about uh, information or or not use an information use it for trading right so you have to also do a lot of internal trading safeguarding compliance orientation to employees uh and then i think it takes a part of 6 month before and 6 month after and after that it stabilizes my sense employees then makes sense are behaving like how they should focus on normal day to day business and not look at the stock price so communication education and focus is yes. the key makes sense how did you develop the muscle for public market investor relations that the, because i'm sure as a you know as a private company cfo um you don't have to just deal with any of that right uh, there are a very limited set of investors that you have to um discuss sort of your vision and sort of your quarterly and you know monthly performance and so on but public mar- mar- market investor relations is quite different number 1 did you enjoy it number 2 how did you develop that muscle no of course um, it is it is very important skills uh, skill that cfo needs to add to uh, his experience and uh, see i used to talk to investors even before company was listed <coughs> uh, the private equity investors and we had investors of uh, you know the put like fidelity uh who are both in private market and public market so when you interact with them they will anyway ask you tough questions uh, even when you are private right on your performance so in that sense there was some continuity but having said that it is definitely a much wider set of in- investor pool that you uh, start attracting when you are public and initially i thought you know it's about ip road shows and we did almost 100 meetings and met 300 investors that really helped right we had a solid demand on nike ipo but soon i realized that you know that is only for getting the ipo subscribed right but people those who have put in money for in the ipo right they they should continue to remain invested for longer tenure right which means that your investor relations is a continuous job it's not a one time job and uh, therefore uh, you know every quarter after the results i used to dedicate 15 days uh, to meet lead investors and analyst right who will track your stock without fail right it was like more of a routine that every, every result announcement next 15 days meet at least 30 40 50 investors and analyst 
and then of course over time you know you will see a consistency in how the research reports are talking about your stock how your investors are seeing you uh, in terms of your performance uh, i think it is also a specialist job in the end so you know we also realize that cfo needs to also help the company in the performance and in running day to day business so we then hired a senior ia special investor relations specialist reporting to cfo who would then also pick up the sentiment sometimes in the formal engagement with cfo and ceo investors may not express the sentiment or undercurrent that they have in their mind uh, but the ir specialist would be able to informally collect those sentiments and relate back to the company management so that they can make course correction right so it's a two way process you communicate to investors but also take their feedback and sentiments and see where you need to course correct uh, but of course you don't need to change your uh, core direction and business model uh, but if there is any communication gap you need to quickly wipe it out so it's is interesting but it is also too much on the plate once you are listed so therefore is my advice would be hire a ir specialist to support you makes sense um based on your experiences what are some common misconceptions or overlooked aspects in the ipo process for the one which i said right many people think ipo is is about making money or is an exit event it is not uh it, it is an entry event in fact uh being public means you are being scrutinized even more and not only a uh, different investor group but also the regulator uh, also press and media and everybody right so you are in limelight so if you think that ipo is about making money and exiting from the scene that's not what it is it is about reaching to a particular level of maturity both as a business model and as a governance internally then you hit uh public market which means you are raising money from new set of investors and you are accountable to them right so you need to deliver on their expectation quarter and quarter at least okay one or two quarter may go bad but then you know let's say people there are many investors who who commit three year five year uh with you right so they will give you that much time uh, but you need to meet their expectations so that they remain invested otherwise we have seen that companies destroy value after being listed some companies even pull back and get delisted for that reason etc etc so it's lot more coming on your plate if you are going there makes sense what advice would you give to companies aspiring to go public in the near future i think uh, um you should have uh, number one you should have be very clear why do you want to do an ipo Uh, is it for capital is it for building a public profile and attracting talent and brand partners uh, or is it for let's say uh, getting a positive performance pressure through the market uh, or anything else right uh, for example sometimes companies may like in vodafone we thought we are seen as a foreign company if we are listed in india uh, we will be seen more as an indian company right so there could be different reasons of why do you want to do an ipo please think about it it's not just that everyone is doing ipo so we should also do it's not a cake walk certainly no the second thing is start building uh, finance team muscles much before the ipo even itself <clears throat> in fact in my view one should think of uh, uh, cfo's role uh, uh, as somebody who can help in creating value uh not just unlock value right so you should have a strong controllership you should have a strong cfo early enough even at, at the you know at the stage of series a series b uh hire a matured cfo who sees a, a vision of scaling the company with you shoulder to shoulder and then taking it public rather than hiring a cfo just before going public uh because by then a lot of uh you know things would have uh shipped up where where you need a clean up so why to land up into that situation right so ideally hire a cfo early and cfo should build a strong finance team in fact sometimes i wonder that why people let's say if they have, they have 
if they have something to invest they will hire a tech techie rather than a finance guy always that will be the choice now of course you you should hire tech team and business team but also build strong finance team they only help you create value of course they will also help you unlock value at some stage so those are two advices have clear vision for why should be an ipo and secondly invest into finance team early enough is there a particular quality or a milestone um that the company should hit or a quality that the company should have to uh, understand that okay now is the right time for us to hire a cfo you said you you refer to series a series b many companies do it after only cvc or you know once they reach a growth stage when when you know is there is there some metric yeah, unless, or unless, uh, any specific quality yeah. unless unless you have a finance domain expertise as co-founder i would say you hire a cfo even before you do your first fundraise right because they help you build the company and create the value from beginning even during the fundraise uh, i have seen that cfos uh, play that role of wearing that negotiation hat and uh, negotiating right uh, uh, shareholder agreement and the clauses under it right sometimes founders end up giving too much uh, on on the rights because they don't understand these aspects of governance but if there was strong cf on the side that person will take care of it uh, i have also seen that um, you know people uh, do bad negotiation during fundraises uh, which again it it may be more anxiety to have sufficient cash and close the fundraise uh, but again cfo can play a role of balancing it out taking care of future interests as well Uh, these are strategic aspects so i w- i would say ha- have a strong cfo on your side from day one very cool let's assume a hypothetical um to say that i'm joining a company as a cfo and this is my day one how would you advise me on my first 100 days at this company yeah i think it's about uh, know the comp- know the business model uh, know the company and the you know company means people right and then know where it stands in terms of processes and governance these are three must know and accordingly you can frame your 100 day plan this is advice my mentor gave me right before you uh, in fact it's not so he he told me that if you are joining a new company you should have you must have 100 day plan but your 100 day plan first 10 days 15 days you just invest into knowing the com- business model of the company and then knowing the people and then knowing where does it stand on processes governance which is the core finance rule and i think that will give you sufficient uh, insights into what are your must achieve and then divide into which are low hanging ones which are the medium term and which are the long term correction that you need to uh, start cracking on so have that plan in first 100 days itself and as a as a new cfo how do you think about sort of you know plucking some of those uh, low hanging fruits and getting some some early wins is it important or you think that um kind of tackling the longer term or getting onto the journey of longer term um items are way more fruitful i think uh, uh, both are important right you need to survive in short term to thrive in long term as they say uh, so you need to so if there are very obvious ones for example <clears throat> uh, you know when i joined pay you i could quickly figure out that you know there is not enough focus on receivables collection right because bulk of our business is anyway prepaid so you collect and then settle so there is no problem of receivables any which way is fundamental of business but there is some part like government accounts where there is a problem on receivables and nobody was focusing on that now it's very low hanging according to me it's matter of focus right so i immediately uh, sort of brought focus into it and it started paying off so you know you need to figure out those low hanging which you will be able to figure out because of your experience but more fundamental structural is what i told you earlier that 
how do we use technology to reduce our cost of processing by 50% and that uh, vision has to be formed uh, based on where do we stand today and where do we want to go and what is the path so i had uh, formed that vision and i shared with my uh, boss and then i also shared with little wider group of management team and i have that requisite sponsorship so within one year we have moved into s4 hana like uh, four out of seven companies have moved into s4 hana and another three are moving by end of uh, march because i don't think uh, without that we can deliver on any of these three which is customer experience uh, compliance and then cost advantage that we want to build so it's very important to have that plan early enough very cool um what are your views on the ceo cfo relationship and do you do anything specific to continue to foster it no of course that's the most important relationship to invest into right um C- ceos lean on cfo on two three things for sure one they lean on cfo to make sure that the reporting uh, the compliance um the the hygiene factors are taken care of right nobody will give you kudos for doing that but if you miss any of those uh, you know you will lose trust day one so you know that's that goes without saying the second thing that they lean on is also to be an internal challenger or internal critique sometimes uh in in payu which is process company in process actually there is a concept called uh, red team or red team is kind of licensed to be contrarian uh, or bring contrary on the table if they see one uh, rather than everybody rallying behind one particular view and then you miss out some essential contrary you are actually encouraged and spe- mostly i've seen finance team take that role of being on the red team to say okay this is the risk i see right so one has to call that out and also suggest a solution for that not just be raising the flag just for sake of raising the flag also be constructive about it so that's a second expectation which ceo will have and i think the third one is of course how do you help the business so whether it is <clears throat> cost optimization whether it is cash flow initiatives whether it is even supporting the new revenue work streams or monetizing what you have already built is also you know where you don't have a uh, very s- solid crystallized hierarchy for you but if you do that then ceos will trust you that you know this finance guy is not just a controller but he is a true business partner so i think these three are the take care of the hygiene <coughs> and um, highlight the risk but also be a business partner who creates value uh, if you adhere these three i think ceos will you will have trust from ceos and they will use you more as a sounding board in fact when you become a listed company and you have to manage board so both ceo and cfo have to share that uh, report to be able to you know combine the view and present a common view to the board uh and uh, if if there is a disconnect there it it really uh bounces back harder on the company so it's a relationship of trust and partnership there arvin what does a successful career look for you i i said it in uh, you know one of my connects uh, with my past past colleagues right where i said okay i didn't have any particular definition of what a successful career means i don't compare it with my peers as such i had my own journey i had a vision which i shared with you that have been accomplished but having said that now it's more about uh, building the community uh, finance community and be part of some nation building uh, bus- business model right so that's what it is uh, more more of it from here on and i think uh, you know the other thing i shared with uh, my colleagues in amazon last week is that uh, chase an opportunity but don't be opportunistic uh, 
you know work like a work in a mission mode and leave a legacy behind so while so wherever i have worked at least you know people recognize that i accomplished something and i contributed something to that company's vision and mission and then moved on which is why they called me back right to share my journey so yeah work in a mission mode but leave a legacy behind i think that's a great advice to even the emerging professionals in the field of finance or just in general uh, very cool do you have uh, any as we are into a new year any top 3 predictions for the tech space for 2024 uh, i think is is not necessarily my prediction uh, but you know last 3 years have taught us that 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 frenzy on uh tech business model which came after covid uh is is uh, i mean that exuberance has come down but it has come down in a meaningful manner to say that which are those uh tech business model which are uh you know profitable scalable sustainable uh, and value creating to customers rather than just having and not tech as a uh, label and in not having a right business model or not having way to earn uh, customers love consistently right so 2024 will further filter it out and i think some of the startups are still sitting on valuation which is uh, a bubble valuation because they have not done any fund raises uh, after 21 on 22 so they may be sitting on a valuation which is not justified uh, till the time they have cash in the balance sheet they they can probably live in that illusion but once they hit the road they will they will realize the uh, what is the actual valuation for them i think in 24 many of them actually can come so they have survived two years but in 24 many of so there has been one set of value correction but the another set of value correction is bound to happen more on the private side public side it has already like market doesn't wait so market has already corrected some of them and they are now inching back by showing part to profitability but on private side some of them are still sitting on exorbitant valuation still not having part to profitability i think they will come to a hard reality shock in 24 having said that i am very upbeat about the whole tech ecosystem i think it's changing the society in a meaningful way and consumer behavior has also shown a big shift from a brick and mortar based business model to digital commerce and digital shopping so it's changing the country also right so in in the long run you know there's lot more opportunity for uh, those tech companies or tech businesses which sharp shoot the customer experience and solve the real problems and also make money for the shareholders so uh, i remain optimistic about about that potential very cool uh, that brings us now to our lightning round kind of our last uh, uh, section um, it's quite simple should be quite fun i'll ask you some quick questions and all i need are immediate responses okay, okay. is it like right. a time Let's check start. you will do <laughs> yeah okay um so sweet or savory sweet books or podcasts books podcast is new experience for me yeah. all right are you a thinker or a doer no i i am a doer uh, like to execute okay an introvert or an extrovert introvert scotch or whiskey what's your guilty pleasure <laughs> none of them <laughs> not okay. alcoholic yeah all right then tea or coffee tea tea how does someone impress you by being authentic If not a CFO, what would you be? Professor. All right. If you can be a CFO of any company in the world for a day, which company would you choose? Infosys. And why? You know, I I said it uh, to some of my friends after Nike IPO that like how Infosys was. We you know I wanted to make Nike seen as first in digital commerce in terms of governance and ethics and standards of reporting so like infosys is respected in the it space for setting the standards which everybody else followed right so that's an inspiration if you could teleport yourself anywhere 
and in any age where would you go and why no i think <laughs> i'm at the right place right time india is the place to be in and i'm i'm at the age where i can use my experience to contribute to the society so i don't want to go anywhere that's the place to be in india is place to be in at this point in time this decade and this century in fact many of our Very friends cool. have come back from us to india because now they realize uh, that india is place to be in. but i have always been like my career has been here and i've been seeing this inflection point uh, which happens in every day consumers life and it changes the society i think it's a place to be in i like to be continuing here what is the ideal place for you to retire my hometown which is okay. jaipur yeah yeah um who is your role model professionally or personally you certainly mentioned your mentors but do you have a yeah, particular role model mm. mr akhil gupta he was bharti airtel cfo and then md uh, he is the role model i actually you know endorsed uh, the book that he has written recently and i sh- shared a copy with my team members because he understands this uh, cfo's role is not just bookkeeping controllership but value creation in fact he innovated some of the pioneering cost uh, models for telecom which made it uh, affordable for indian consumers like this tower sharing thing is his brain child and it has gone to a you know case study in harvard also so akhil gupta was not just cfo he was really a strategic business partner so he's ideal awesome in fact i got an ultimate to, question i got a chance to meet him also and that was my good day very cool very cool uh the penultimate question one thing that can make you 10 times more productive one thing that makes me 10 times more productive okay no i think um, i do a uh, bit of yoga and meditation in the morning and it recharges my battery and i i think that day is more productive for me by yards like I, the versus the day when i have not done that very cool the last one describe yourself in three words i think i'm uh, authentic i'm ambitious and i'm also accountable so three is <laughs> accountable in the sense i take ownership of what have done or not done awesome arvin this has truly been an amazing show uh, i've been keeping copious notes of all of the various frameworks that you have put in i think this has been a tremendous journey for all of our listeners to go through and uh, apply a lot of these frameworks um, and the various uh, sort of tactic tactics that you have shared in their day to day so thank you so much for taking the time and uh, you know good luck for a happy 2024 no thank you so much rohit for inviting me i also enjoyed the conversation and you are very kind to say that uh, you you liked it hopefully your audiences will also like it uh, but thank you so much and wish you a great uh, happy new year 2024 that brings us to the end of this episode we hope you'll find at least one nugget that is beneficial to you as always thanks for listening to strategy of finance if you enjoy the show please rate and review us on youtube apple podcast spotify or our website www.strategyoffinance.com your comments will make us better you can also follow us on linkedin and twitter and share the word in your network so other people in the finance community can also benefit Be sure to tune in next week for another engaging conversation. Until then, this is Rohit Agarwal and remember to learn, grow and inspire.